Hello, and welcome to the DenJS Contributors Meeting. Today is Friday, July 14th, 2017. And uh, my name is Chasen, and today uh, I'm joined by some core and non-core team members alike. Uh, would you all like to introduce yourselves? This is Justin from Chicago. CDN your SSR. <laughs> this is Kevin from not quite as Chicago. Um, I don't what CDN your I don't know what that means. Matthew, Nobody knows what it means. Kentucky. Ah, you're interrupted. <laughs> Matthew from Kentucky. Gets the people going. Yeah. Uh, and Sheriff, want to introduce yourself? You're muted, Sheriff. Yeah, yeah it sounds like, it looks like his mic isn't uh, coming undone. Uh, uh, so my name is Chase and I'm from Long Beach and I also want to know uh, what CDM your SSR means because uh, I got asked that at a meetup last night. So uh, it's fun times. Okay, uh, let's go to, uh, let's start statuses. Um, let's go reverse order. Sheriff, um, do you want to talk about uh, last week, uh, what you did last week and uh, stuff you have coming up next week? Uh, for the last week, I was not available because I had a lot of work and my daily job, so I did extra hours. But I followed what was uh, in the issues. I tried uh, to choose one, but I was very tired the, the last week. So hop hopefully the, the next week I will be better than the last this week and I will work uh, uh, on some issues. Cool. Sounds good. Uh, Matthew. Uh, uh, yeah, I, uh, I worked on the incremental rendering this week. Um, got it pretty much, my demo pretty much done. I'm not sure when we're going to do a release, though. Uh, but I'm going to be helping out Justin with uh, a uh, presentation he's working on. So do a lot more HTTP2 stuff in the last, next couple weeks. Cool. Sounds good. Kevin? Um, so this week I haven't really done anything. I've, I've been working on a, a client project that is wrapping up early next week, so I should have more time to work on stuff starting like next Wednesday. Cool, sounds good. Justin. I worked on a streaming presentation that I'm gonna give at that con uh, about three, four weeks from now. I'm gonna probably show a sneak peek of it later uh in the hour i'm good um all right and then uh so a week ago um i released uh, dungeons 1.0.1 uh with npm5 support you can upgrade by running npm install fmg um to update um launched search on kinjs.com so now in the black bar on the uh, left hand side there's a little search field you can search for stuff uh check it out if you haven't used it already um i last night i presented at javascript la um video was recorded um so i'll post a link uh in all of the places once uh once that's up on youtube um and then for next week um we still have uh, some KinJS nine three or KinJS three point nine stuff to promote. Um, some of the stuff that Christopher is going to talk about today. Um, so I'm going to help with that, and then I have a bunch of in progress stuff that um, just need to close out, um, and then uh, figure out what our upcoming priorities are. Um, so yeah, uh, let's go to topics. Um, Christopher, do you want to talk first about uh, React V model? Sure. Um... Share my screen. Nope. Can you see? Yep. Perfect. Um, so the way React View Models works is you have a uh, view model that fits the normal uh, CanJS stash method, except you plug it into a React component instead of a stash component. And you still get the same auto re-rendering when the view model changes. You still get the observations. Um, so there's two different ways to use it. Um, you can use it with the React view model function. So it looks kind of like a stash setup where you still provide just your, rend your React render function and the view model. And uh, in this case, it's just a really simple counter click 
goes up. Um, and then for React devs out there, you can also create it as a component. You just extend the React view model component instead of a React component. And you provide the view model as a static on your class and render it like normal. And you get that same sort of functionality. Um, that is really cool. Does anyone have any questions or comments about this? No? Cool. OK. Pretty straightforward, I think. Uh, sorry, say that again. I did have someone uh, ask us if they should use uh, JSX and React now. And um, I emailed them back saying, uh, no, that wouldn't be recommended yet. My guess is that um, you know this is this is currently like kind of an experiment with within Batovi. I mean, definitely try it out. I, I mean, if you're willing, if you want to try something new and, and that kind of thing, try it out. It's not like our preferred path. My guess is that um, CanJS eventually evolves to kind of have a JSX path and a kind of maybe stash based or similar technology to the things that like stash provides a uh, template solution. I'm not totally sure, but this is a fun thing to play with. Or if you are using, um, if you are using react, you should definitely check it out. Definitely use it. <laughs> if you're using CanJS, then uh, it's something to look at and to play with for sure. Um, it's not, and we are supporting it. It's just not like, it's not like hard in the way everything else is quite yet. Very new, still, still fresh. That Christopher, new, did you have a new library smell all over sorry, it? Sorry, go ahead. Nothing, I'm not, lame joke. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Christopher, did you have any other uh, uh, um, related modules that you wanted to show off, or was it just that one? Just that one. There cool. will be some stuff within the next couple of weeks, but that's all for now. Cool. Sounds great. Uh, any other questions or comments before we move on? Um, Bianca, um, would you like to uh, talk about indie JSON streams and some stuff you've published and uh, all of the all of the cool stuff you've been working on recently? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Jason. Um, so I'm Bianca. I'm a JavaScript developer here at Batovi. Um, lately, I've been working on some modules that support IndieJSON streams. Probably means nothing to you right now, but um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a problem, a solution, maybe show you some pictures, then we'll get into some code, and hopefully by the end of this, you'll, you'll have an idea what that means. Cool. So let's start with the problem. Let's see if I can find it. So a common problem is this spinner. When we're loading large chunks of data. Sorry to interrupt. Sure. Right, Can you uh, see? Do you want to share your screen? Oh, thank you. Yes, I do. Cool. Mm, Jason's for cursing. Um, <laughs> cool. So um, I was saying, so this problem here that um, all of us, I'm sure, has, exp has, has experienced, which is the spinner, right? terrible problem for UX. And if we're loading large chunks of data, right, the spinner can go on forever if um, your internet's slow, even longer. And so um, we're trying to solve this problem with Indie JSON streams. So in the current model, when you think about um, doing AJAX, making an HTTP request, you're waiting for an entire JSON object to be sent over the wire. And we all know that under, you know, under the hood that it's actually being sent in chunks and then stitched together and then presented in a way that um, our code understands. And so what we're doing here is we are um, accessing the underlying stream of data, which is just smaller chunks being sent over the wire and then later being stitched together. But in this, um, scenario, we are, we are creating smaller chunks of the data so we can actually take a large chunk of JSON, break it into smaller lines that make sense um, for whatever you're doing. In this case, right, maybe a line would be 
some to do or you know maybe a list of friends if you're on social media so we're breaking this larger chunk of indie json into smaller chunks so when we make that request we can send it one line at a time and as soon as that line arrives we can start um, rendering it manipulating it whatever whatever it is that you want to do with that data instead of waiting for the entire um, json object so this is cool because it's uh you know your users like this picture they get to see the what they want to see sooner and also because since we're we're manipulating and rendering etc while we're also fetching it kind of creates like a parallel like a parallel effect which increases overall performance so it's really a win-win um, overall and if you're interested in there's a couple blogs that are um, posted in the in the discussion so um, here's a here's a picture with some code you can see we're using um, the fetch API which really powers uh, this technique and so with the fetch API in Chrome 52 plus we are able to have access to a streaming response from the server and so if we have an API layer that is set up to send a streaming response we can um, use it with fetch Let's have it reset so it does a query it gets a row and this is an example with a database we create a way to deliminate it right we use a new line here so it's just line by line really we get that response body as a stream and then similar to json.parse we have this method called indie json stream and that's what um, i've been working on for the past couple weeks um, which allows us to take this stream of indie json indie json is just the smaller chunk of json right it's not anything new except there's a new line character at the end and um, we're parsing it just like we would do json.parse but instead of turning a json object into a javascript object we're turning uh, a, a stream of json into a stream of javascript objects and then let's wait for it to reset one more time actually i should have just used this as slides it would have i could have changed the speed so we're writing it our response is the stream of indie json we're parsing it into a stream of objects and then we're reading it once we get that individual line we can do whatever we want with it in this example we're rendering it um, but there's a lot of implications for this which i'm sure you can think about um, Great, so the module is can indie JSON stream. It's json.parse for indie JSON. Again, reminder, indie JSON is just um, JSON that has JSON objects on a line for itself. Let's see if I have an example of what it looks like. Here we go. So it's just JSON separated on new lines. And uh, so json.parse for indie json it returns a readable stream of javascript objects which you can use you know you can get crazy with it so we have an example with async await also using promises and then we also have a article here on how to create an api that will send a stream of indie json so you can take a look at it here on the batovi blog um, and then if we want to look uh, I think this might actually cover it. We can look at the example of what it might look like. This is throttled. You can see it's getting one row and now it's rendering it here on the screen. It's throttled, I think, like 500 milliseconds or something like that. So, yeah, that's Indie JSON Streams. It's a way to send large chunks of data into smaller chunks um, and then be able to render and manipulate it right away rather than waiting for the entire object to resolve. So moral of the story, uh, less loading symbols, more happy users, happier developers, we're stronger, faster, better. That's Andy Jason. Uh, that is really, really cool to like see the actual demo um, yeah. comments for Bianca about this.
Yeah, I think it's uh, one thing interesting. You know, your example you just showed there, it's just like one little tiny line of, but usually if you're doing something like e-commerce website or something where you have search results or you have some type of listing, like, you know, it's going to be a, a much larger chunk of HTML. So you're probably only going to fit, I don't know, like six or seven items on a page anyways. So the real benefit is like the user is going to see every, their, their viewport is going to be full filled really quickly, you know, and then and meanwhile, we're still rendering stuff down the page, but you know, they're, they're able to see as much as they really need to see immediately. And they, they almost don't feel the effect of it streaming in, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, yeah. I, I thought that was a great point that you made about how, this, one cool thing about this is how you're kind of breaking up the work involved where instead of, you know, if you, if you wait to 100 items to load and then render it, you're, you're, you're doing a lot of work when you render all those things. But here we're just kind of incrementally doing it, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Thanks. I'm pretty excited about it. I think Justin is too. Is Justin also going to talk about this today? No, no, a slice of it, slice but not, not, I show it how it fits into a broader picture. Cool. So I have a, I have a question about that last example, the glitch that you showed. Um, mm -hmm. You said it's being throttled. Is, where is it being throttled? Like the uh, on the server. On the server. Yeah. Okay, so it waits 500 milliseconds. That would be. Yeah, there's of... a set interval in there, um, just to just to slow it down so we can see what's actually going on. Okay, and mm -hmm. that kind of simulates the database query or whatever, right? Because you're, or are you using, yeah. yeah. Exactly, okay. simulates that. It can simulate like a slow internet right. connection. Um, also, it just helps wrap your head around what is happening. Yeah, you can actually yeah. see it happening. Because okay, otherwise cool. it, just, it just basically looks like it happens right away, even though it's doing it line by line. Yeah, so it's a, it's a good point though, is like kind of like, when is this gonna be throttled in real life? Because you think about like uh, a lot of queries are you know are are keyed by an index or something, and those are going to be super fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there might be some advantage to streaming. There's not a huge one, but you think about something like search, where it's much slower to actually do that. Um, you actually have to like you know search the individual records. You know, databases databases can be tuned for that. Uh, you're going to see the effect more there. I think. Yeah. Yeah, or if you're you're doing joins or whatever you're. Yeah. I say even with joins, they're usually. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're doing joins wrong, I guess. Is Great. Anything else? Cool. Like well, I said, there's um, blog posts linked in the discussion. And oh, I forgot to mention that this is also supported by Can Connect. So for those of you who use Can Connect, uh, we have a behavior that. Uh, that supports indie JSON streaming. So it's can connect indie JSON. And early next oh. week, there will be a blog post uh, published about that. Yeah. So yeah, check that out when it's out. Um, cool. Uh, OK, thanks, Bianca. Thanks for uh, going through that and, sh and demoing that app to us. Um, Kevin, I think you were next um, to talk about can reflect. Yeah, so um, now that CanJS 3.9.0 is out, I wanted to reflect on what we did with CanReflect. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, I kind of wrote the three kind of major goals that we had, I guess, at the beginning of CanReflect or that kind of came out over time doing CanReflect. So I um, kind of want to just talk about those and whether or not we actually accomplished them. Um, so the first one was the, to kind of speed up Stash by using observations instead of computes under the hood and stash. And um, I think that one we definitely achieved. I, I don't know, Justin, if you have the, the numbers. You said it's 25 or something percent faster now. Uh, I just looked at It's not actually that much faster. I think we have to look at it again. It definitely was when I laid in like the first version, and I just was pulling up uh, it again. And it's not that fast anymore, so maybe we need to look at it again one more time. Okay. I totally claim that. I mean, all theoretically should be because observations are observations. I, I just I'm looking at they're still much faster than computes. So there's just probably something that yeah 
some additional complexity we might have added while getting tests to pass that we have to go back and think about. OK, cool. Um, so yeah, the second goal is to, to kind of provide a path to using other types of observables and templates. So it's like uh, your, our Kefir streams or RxJS streams or whatever next cool thing somebody wants to use. Um, so I, I don't think that's quite ready yet. You can't actually use Kefir streams directly in templates. But um, with camera reflect in place, we could make that possible. Cool. And then the last one is kind of just to clean up our code throughout CanJS. So we had a lot of places that were checking if, if an object was a map and then using adder, or checking if it's a define map and using get and set, and checking if it's compute and calling it as a function and all that kind of stuff. And now with CanReflect, we have kind of a consistent set of APIs, and we don't have to, to have that code everywhere. So that that is a big win, um, if not for our users, at least for, for us developing. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's pretty much all I want to talk about with CamReflect. If anyone, Justin, is there anything else or anybody else that you want to talk about with, with CamReflect now that it's landed? Um, no, it's glorious though. That question. What, what what's your what's your question? I have an in the weeds question. Uh, so my I've worked. I, it's been a while since I've worked on some a lot of this stuff. Uh, my in my mind, I'm thinking the old can observation reader kind of was kind of like can reflect. Is it is that gone now? Is that completely replaced by can can reflect? Uh, it uses it internally. Um, it. Why do we still need it? What's different about it? What does it do? Uh, we need it because it does some weird things that would be better done other ways. Probably now, like it it it. it it like uh, so. Can observation reader is is designed to like given a let's let's talk about it visually because I I cannot think with words. Um, so so can observation reader is gone, but what was can observation? Oh reader? well, it's can stash key now. It's now can stash key. Yeah. Um, so can stash key or can observation reader, you would do like get and you would pass it some like object that had. Uh, a compute that had a map that had a observable property with some value that might have also had another compute or something like that, <laughs> and you know just you know it's a uh, let's just say the compute had that right like it's the idea is that you'd pass it that and then you would be able to pass it something like uh well i want to read whatever's at the compute of that object then i want to read the prop then i want to read compute two and what it was supposed to be smart enough to do was say like well okay we see a normal object here i can read the normal object's property i see that there's a compute value so i know that's a value it doesn't have like properties of its own, but I, it, it wraps another value. So I'm going to unwrap it, get the map inside of it, read the prop on the map, and then that map has an in, a nested object maybe, and that has a compute2 value. And then I'm going to see that there's a the next compute there, and then I'm actually going to read the compute at the end of this. And then I'm going to give you something that's equivalent, like it'll tell you the parent object, like what this compute was on, which would be this prop value. And it would also tell you the value that is essentially returned. It would also be able to do some other things like tell you, did this find an observable? Did it, uh, where did it find the observable? Because like, we can do some interesting caching work that we don't ever have, once we've read this, we know that the compute read, this object, this compute property read on this object, we don't actually ever have to do that again because it itself is not observable. So we could actually start at the reading of this outer compute. So it can it 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 can do a lot of things like that to uh, speed up future reads. So some of that kind of stuff is still really useful. It's all being done with can reflect now under the hood, so that. The idea is like I can now have a what what you should be able to do is like let's say I had some kind of event stream that was producing, you know, if I did on value, 
for some reason, this is going to produce a whole bunch of can maps. <laughs> like the current val the last observed value is a can map that had a you know a promise in it as it's there was a promise prop property and there's a new promise there or something like that. Now what you you could do is like I could do get uh, event stream and I could say promise that you know is pending and because event streams now have the um have the are, are going to have we need this is something that we need to do still but this is like literally the work of an hour um we need to we need to add the symbol so there's a can symbol and can reflect kind of work together we would add the can dot value symbol on all really what we'd be adding it to is kefir so on all of their event stream type I'm actually not totally sure how to go in there and get this, but on, on their event stream type, they had we would add the can get value symbol, and we would say, hey, well, here's how you go get it, and we would add the on value and off value as well, um, just like we've done already for promises, so that we see that event stream kind of represents a value, so we're just gonna kind of unwrap it to get its last emitted value. Uh, then we see that it's a map. We know how to read the get key value on map types to read whatever promise is. And then we've also decorated promises. So they have get key value for things like is pending, is resolved, is rejected, value, and reason. So that's why if you have had a event stream in your template, you can just, you should just be able to write stuff like event stream promise that is pending. Now this right here is part of the reason why I really like, like, you know, I feel like I want some kind of JSX-ish um, uh, alternative. I really like JSX, but I also like the ability to um, use data types that are event emitters that don't actually have like a real like is pending or in this case event streams don't actually have a like permanent value but treat it as if it does just for the purposes of the template because that's super heck hella convenient if, if you know what i mean i, I kind of don't i i i don't know what you mean because how is an event stream ever pending how is it ever pending? Well, this is the event stream's last item, what its last value was. It, it is, might have admitted last a, pro, a map that has a promise in it that is pending. This is a crazy example here. Like, this is an okay. example that you probably wouldn't see in real life. More likely, you have an event stream that's like, hey, I want, the num the, I want an event stream. You do want to like, be able to get the last value from an event stream. Yes, almost always, right? If you're if the event stream is being used to render to the template, you almost always have to do that. In a JSX world or a React world, what you do is like you're listening to like on, on the you have your let's just say there was a number, right? It was just producing like the the number of times you clicked them on a button. In this button click stream, in JSX world you do something or like React world, you would listen to it and then you're gonna call like you know, set state with like your button click count, and then you do, um, you know, here's your value, and you're you're gonna always call set state with really you're gonna a chain, you know, you're gonna mutate, you're gonna merge this into your old state, this new button click count, and when your when your stream changes, and you're always gonna have to kind of prepare this value for the template. Right, and that's because JSX is, um, you know, it's just transpiling mostly to JavaScript reads. But if we had JSX transpile to something more like, you know, uh, for every every everything that it saw like this, you know, you know that that kind of thing. If you had your div and you had whatever, if we had it transpile for our version of it to something more like div. Um, you know, we could even make it like, um, you know, 
well, you create an element here, but uh, I'm just going to do it as like the old string form. But this is, you know, you, you would do it more like um, is it, uh, if you're using H or something, hyperscript, it would be like div. And then uh, is it just an array in here? And then here you would do something like what, what I would want is, because this whole thing would be wrapped by a compute, you would have something more like, um, like read event stream promise that is pending. Okay, can and you it, uh, scroll that into view more? Yep, yep, yep. Right. So this would, this would always like use our can reflect to be able so that you don't have to do this boilerplate all the time of converting your streams or whatever to values like on your state. You could just have streams as part of your state. You could have promises as part of your state. You don't need to expose like the is pending rejected blah 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 on on your on your state. Like nope, that's just that can be there. You can treat that as normal data. You don't always have to get it into plain JavaScript object world for it to be like used in the template. And that's a, that's a big advantage, I think, that like our template engine has that I would like to keep. I think it's cool. That'd be, I wonder how you would do that, but. I think you just, you would have to add a new transpiling rule to just say like this stuff instead, any, any dot operator gets tr transpiled to something more like this. Uh, just everything goes through read. Yep, everything goes through read. So yeah, the one thing you mentioned, we, we have this can reflect promise library that, that adds this kind of stuff, adds is pending and the other is resolved, all those, to, to promises. We should be able to use that now in React View model. I don't know if Christopher, you tried that out. Um, I know you were asking about this a while back, how to make that stuff work. How Christopher was, Christopher was asking? Yeah. The only way that the way that Christopher would have to do that would be right now until we have something like I mean he could use I think I think uh, can stash key is kind of gross to use right now it's like I think this actually if there's like a get function so you could just do that key dot get and you could you could literally just just do this kind of thing inside like that so if you had a promise. You could just do your is pending. The the reflect way of doing it would be more to do something like div um, can reflect get key value, which we, we wanted these things to be kind of long and terse. So you'd do your promise and then is pending this way. And that way it's going to read the is pending in an observable. Because this is really like a virtual value. It's not a value that actually exists on the promise. It's like something we're decorating the promise with if you're using reflect. So um, you would have to go through this, but I think we, we can just make it easier this way. You know, there already is like a low dash get, you know? And that's basically what the idea is. This is very similar to that. But it can work with like virtual, virtual values that will only really exist if you're a binding to them and things like that. So what's, what is can reflect promise? Can reflect, go ahead. No, it's okay, go ahead. Can reflect promise is essentially us decorating promises with these virtual, with these methods, these virtual you're doing there. Okay. symbols on promises so that this kind of thing works. This used to be done by can observation reader. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but now can observation reader is supposed to work on generic against the generic can reflect API. In some ways what can observation reader what a better thing would be is can reflect there would just be like a like can reflect or like some kind of project based on can reflect that's like get nested value and you pass it anything and you and you just start doing whatever and it does the same kind of thing right we, we, we could just create a gen this this could almost this really could a version of this be brought into can reflect the only difference is 
canned key does all of those, does a few additional performance optimizations that, and exposes some data that you wouldn't want it to do. Also, one final thing it can do is, let's say that you're actually, this resolves to a function. Key can bind on its parent for you. That's why it also can provide the parent for you. But you can tell key like, well, if this thing is gonna give me a function, make sure it's contextually bound because I like, I typically wanna then just be able to call it, you know, with some arguments and I want the context to be right. So AASF is being called with its this as whatever ASDF is. So key can do a few fancy things like that. That, that that's kind of why I think it's it, it's should be its own project. Maybe it's called can stash key, but I could really see like a you know can reflect key kind of project that is not quite as heavily designed for just solving stashes problems. But anyways, that's that's in some ways like what can reflect can do is it can the the other thing that we could do with it that I think would be cool is kind of create our own lodash for it that like Lodash right now doesn't support, like if you do assign, I, I'm almost 100% positive you can't do like new map, you can't like assign two maps. I'm positive you can't like assign an object to a map, right? Or like a map to an object. Pretty sure you can't do these things. Um, with can reflect because we can decorate any type to have like, well, we, here's how you read its actual like, well, we consider enumerable properties, maps, the things stored on a map aren't actually considered enumerable properties by JavaScript, but we could decorate it so that they would, so that, you know, hey, I want to loop over this, this its own properties, and this its own properties, and be able to copy them by using get and set and get and set over here, or if it was just an object, it knows how to do it. Uh, that's kind of what Reflect's job is, is to kind of provide across a huge swath of types um, expose their capabilities so they can work together. So that's uh, that can reflect. Any other uh, questions or comments? No. Cool. Um, did anyone have uh, anything else that they wanted to talk about or present before we go? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to show a sneak preview of one part of the presentation that I'm working on. Cool. Just, just to get get all the Dungeon fanboys and girls a little a little taste of something cool before everybody else in Wisconsin Dells does. Um, <laughs> So the crux of my presentation is just how we're, we're improving performance. And uh, part of this is what um, Bianca talked about. And then the rest of this is uh, stuff that Matthew has been working on. But I'm going to take credit because that's, that's what you get to do when you're the boss. Um, the, the general JavaScript uh, application loads like this. Can you all see my screen? Because I can't see you right now. Yes, uh, and I presented you to yes. everyone. Yeah, um, and I can't tell if that joke about me being the boss landed. I'm just going to assume yes. <laughs> um, all right, so the uh, I wish I could show my mouse, but it won't. The software won't let me. But you uh, know, we, you, you uh, your mouse, by the you way, can. I can't see my mouse. That's really weird. Well, um, <laughs> I'm glad you can. I, I cannot. So the. At the start, right, you, you, um, you make a request, it goes to your server, and then typical client side without server side rendering, it sends back a little bit of HTML that'll start bootstrapping your JavaScript. Once your JavaScript is loaded, it starts making requests for your data, that might go to your database or other caching systems, and then that's all kind of processed at once and then responded with, and then at one big chunk you get all of your data. Um, what we're gonna present is kind of like a more, is, a, is in some ways a unified theory of optimal performance in, in kind of one of these future technologies like um, 
HTTP2 push, fetch, streams, all of that stuff lands in uh, enough browsers to be worth it. Uh, that Chrome is now the most popular browser and does support all these things starts pretty much making it worth it because all of this stuff you can fall back to older ways of doing it if your browser doesn't support it. So the new way that things would work is essentially uh, your website uh, user makes a request to your server. Your server is going to use HTTP to push, to start pushing out um, the HTML and JavaScript uh, for your page, right? So instead of it a round trip, it could start pushing your JavaScript right away. Um, then, because we're going to be doing server-side rendering and this thing that uh, Matthew and I have been working on called incremental server-side rendering. It's going, the server's going to make a request to your database or whatever your data that needs to be shown. And it's going to, as it's going to also connect in a stream fashion, just like um, Bianca showed. But in this case, the stream's actually running all in the server-side rendering uh, in, the, uh, in Node. So it's going to start making database requests. And as every database request comes back, just like in the client, what's going to happen is we're going to build the HTML for it in the server, but then we're going to send, as we mutate our virtual DOM in the server, we're going to send those same modifications we're making out as commands to, um, as, uh, as commands that the HTML, the, the client, the, the, the browser is basically retrieving. We're also pushing those just like we're pushing JavaScript. It's retrieving and it's updating itself as it's getting these uh, DOM commands to change things. So then as the database uh, request finished, every record that kind of gets back, it's going to be pushing another record after another record after another record. So essentially the user, this is about as optimal performance for the users they can get, really quickly they should be able to get a server-side rendered page. Their JavaScript is downloading as fast as possible. But in the background, the server is doing everything it can to like push out you know, uh, little DOM changes so that the user would start seeing these rows come in even before their JavaScript payload has finished. And, if their job, and then what we're eventually planning on doing is making so if their JavaScript payload finishes early, then it can actually start requesting the data um, but well, it probably won't need to request the data because it's kind of in flight, but it would kind of take over and reattachment would happen and things like that. So this is, this is, this is the idea of kind of mixing streams and HTT, uh, to push to what I, I achieve or I expect will be some really good performance gains. And Matthew's actually already done a lot of the, the legwork in his article. Um, which I will now pitch so everybody rereads it if they haven't already. Um, please pitch. Please pitch. Um, utilizing HTTP to push in a single page application. Uh, he, he talks about the benefits, especially in a, if your server is really fast, which like, you know, a, generally speaking, um, you know, most companies that are successful at least have the budget to really get their server performance is, is, is quite good, um, and they can even get good data. But on a really slow connection, this technique, especially with big JavaScript payloads that take a while to get to the client and, and start things, can really pay off. Right here, I think it was like an 800 uh, kilobyte JavaScript file, I think. Right, Matthew? Uh, it sounds right, yeah. I think it, that's what's listed in the article. With like an 800 kilobyte JavaScript package. So that's like, you know, that's pretty big, right? You, you want most pages to, but big single page applications can get that large. That's like on the larger end. And if you were on a slow connection, what, do you remember the slow connection stats? It's like a 3G or something like that. I believe it was 3G. 3G, on a 3G, right, you're talking about, uh, 304 milliseconds to like show kind of like something is out, like it's, it, it's kind of loaded. Um, the first render, you know, you're talking about a huge like 18 second gap of performance that gets closed out by essentially just using the, the pushing server-side rendering. 
So um, it's yeah, kind of what I learned from from all that research is just that whatever the slowest part of your app is is like that's the bottleneck. It sounds obvious, but <laughs> well, let me try to restate that in a different way. Um, this technique, especially because I, we didn't, you know, at, once you start putting out pushing out the JavaScript, let's just say. Um, your JavaScript payload was really small and could load very fast, well then JavaScript would start doing all of the work and you had a very fast browser or whatnot that could just like handle all this co crazy complex JavaScript. And then JavaScript would do the work. But if it couldn't, then the server is gonna do as much work. The, the way to think about this is, yes, whatever is the slowest part of your application is your bottleneck, but only necessarily in this system. Because the bottleneck, like without something like this, could be, you know, well, the, the overhead of going back and forth, your network, right, could be, could be the overhead. Um, or it could be the JavaScript performance speed or whatever. What this does is it's like every part of the system is trying to do as much as it possibly can, as fast as it can. Um, so if your server becomes the bottleneck, well, then it's the bottleneck. It, you know, it's not going to be what it's not going to be your the person's client. If it's the client, then it's going to be the client, and the server is going to try to compensate as much as possible. It's basically like everybody is doing as much as they can. Um, but it's kind of like you 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 plan for the worst case scenario. It's kind of like yeah. well, we're going to assume a slow connection, so we're just going to eliminate that bottleneck just by ignoring it, <laughs> just be you know just by not depending on it. I guess you would say. Um, I, that's kind of the way I think about it. Yeah. Yeah, I just think it's like you're, you're firing at all cylinders. So, like, yeah, if one cylinder is broken, that's okay. You're, you've got other ones firing. Um, so, it should result in, like, most situations about as optimal performance as you can get. So, um, this, this presentation will just be going through. Uh, I actually opened the wrong one. It was two. Um, you know, I'll just be talking through NDJSON stuff, which we've already seen, how to do NDJSON uh, with Postgres, how uh, HTTP2 uh, works so that you can actually push out other assets with these push promise headers, um, examples of setting that up in Node, and then examples of setting up like the, the, the incremental rendering. And that will be, and how it all works, so. That's it for me. Awesome. Yeah, yeah it's gonna be it's, it's gonna really be really cool. excited when we get all this and done SSR because I think there's you know this focusing on I've been focusing on the incremental rendering but there's so much so many optimizations we can build into into the done SSR for for HDB two. Yeah. It's, it's cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, your questions, comments. Nope. Okay. I, uh, I, want, I have, anyone, I have yeah. a comment on it. I just think it's crazy. I mean, I think it's like the coolest. I, I don't know. I, I, I. What the incremental rendering specifically? Yeah, yeah. It's just so crazy that it's like. I, I love. I. It, it's been my one of. I think it's like there's every once in a while. I think we have really cool ideas. <laughs> And this is a really cool idea. And like Matthew and I, when we were originally going to do it, it was like, oh, we're going to like do all this, um, uh, like, because because we were just making the assumption that we had to do server side rendering linear, right? We were all linear thought, man. Like, and we were going to be like, well, somehow we have to know every part of the page when it's like totally done, and. Uh, track that and somehow like create these really complex systems to track that to be able to like push out linearly the server the, the final HTML and then just like a crazy thought because we were talking about HTTP 2 push and it's like we were talking about fetch and fetch can like you know get streams and it's like well this confluence of technologies all came kind of came in and there was like a spark that was just like hey let's let's try this crazy idea that right as the HTML page loads, it's gonna make a fetch streaming fetch request 
for a bunch of instructions on how to like keep updating the page. And then the server side rendering can just like, basically every time it's like mutation observers, basically it's just spitting those right back to the client. It's crazy that it even works and it's crazy that it actually produces performance benefits. I just think it's crazy. I, I don't, I, it's bananas. Yeah. Do you think the people who created these APIs or specs for these APIs had this in mind or knew that this would, that they would work together? No way. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I feel like if I don't, if people aren't passing out at the end of this presentation, I did not do the content justice. <laughs> Cause it's just that it's like that crazy and that cool to me. But we all love our babies, so. <laughs> it, it is really cool. Cool, uh, anything else? Do you uh, think this? Uh, do you think this would be faster than like the other streaming technique? It's a definitely a lot simpler. Um, it's much much well, easier. I think else. it has some advantages in that. I don't know if it would necessarily. Be, I think it has some advantages in that you don't lock up because, like you know, a lot of times it, it, you're not dependent on page architecture. Right, the, the other streaming technique, like um, let's say you had a page and you had, um, you had a list of products, but you had a person's cart in the header and it had like a little number that was like mm -hmm. saying 10 items in their cart. And let's just say the, the page, like the number of products in a search result page, that's like super hella fast because that could be cached, but you can't really cache the person's session information as easily or whatever. Well, in, that, in this case, then absolutely yeah. it would be faster because right. what we would have had to do in the old way is we'd have to see, like, we're rendering the header, and then the header has that number in it. We have to wait till that number gets back before we can start rendering the product information. Yeah, there is to be, there is to be, you have to consider, you definitely have to consider streaming in, like, the design of your pages. With yeah, so, technology. sure, the other way to do it would be to force it on users and, like, hey, user, you need to know what's fast and what's not fast, and you have to, like, compensate for that. So, yeah, yeah it's possible the other one could be faster because it's just, like, a kind of a single sweep, and it's just, like, it's not sending out instructions. For sure, it could be faster because the cl we're, our client is making that connection, and there's no, overhead there. about the session thing that's... Even though I have an example app that does that, that's the that's that's the point, I guess. Is that yeah? That's a big reason we it, changed it. Doesn't, it doesn't prefer doesn't prefer top stuff over like everything's equal. I guess is the advantage. So yeah, so many think, apps are built like that, right? Where you have like your cart icon yeah. matter, or even on pages that aren't showing search results. You know, on pages that are just it's like welcome Justin, the user. Like your about page, and it has the cart in the top or whatever. So it's good in that regard, uh, maybe because I worked on it. Uh, the the disadvantage would be that is that uh, support you, browser support. Well, yeah, but there's also yeah, it has to be cooperative. You can't like when you get to the client, you can't start messing with the pages with the page in any way because if once you don't once you do that, uh, I guess what I'm saying is that the client side JavaScript when the client side JavaScript takes over, it has to fully take over. It can't like. Can't you can't keep getting instructions? Um, well, you just ignore them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. It's like you can't you can't get instructions and do start doing stuff in the client at the same time. You kind of have to you have to swap. Yeah, I mean the advantage of the other one is that it would work with HTTP one, right? As we could you know we yeah. we would just serialize and provide a single asset, and it would work in all browsers and things like that but it was much harder to make work. It would put more on the users. So, I mean, it's still, it's still an option that we could always, of course, try it, but I would rather, I would rather just like focus on getting this technology right and then like a year from now or two years from now when every browser supports it, it's like the easy, it's like the, it's the to me it's like the, the in terms of, the performance gains, you get a huge amount of performance gains, maybe not quite as much as the other one, and then eventually browser support will be just as much. And then also users um, and what their expectations are will, will be really high, or, or like it'll be easiest for them. Uh, so I think it's just the, the best 
I think it's the best solution for us to pursue. Cool. All right. Cool. Thanks, Justin. I uh, saw some comments in uh, the Batovi Slack that you killed it today. I, I would agree. Actually, everyone had some really cool stuff to, to talk about. So uh, thank you to everyone that uh, presented. Um, anyone have anything before we go? Nope. Um, who's watching on YouTube, either the live stream or afterwards, thanks for watching. And uh, see you guys next week. Bye.